here. This is really kind of our transitional service, isn't it? We're going from the summertime schedule to our fall and winter schedule. That starts next week. Church will not begin at 9.30 next week. It will begin at 10 o'clock as it will for the rest of the winter. Uh, also what begins next week then is Sunday school. The, all the materials are in for the younger kids. Uh, we're also looking forward to this class that we have coming up uh, for the high school kids and for the adults. Uh, as we come into this election season, we're going to be focusing on how we can think biblically. Uh, not think as a Republican or not think as a Democrat. Think <laughs> biblically uh, about the issues that our society faces. I know a lot of you are looking forward to this. It's going to be a good time uh, and uh, invite you to that. So that starts at 9 o'clock uh, coming up this coming Sunday. You're going to want to be a part of that. Come here at 9 o'clock. Uh, we'll have some great discussions together. And then at 10 o'clock, we'll be in here meeting together as God's people. We come together this morning, not because this was our idea to assemble together and uh, uh, do something different on Sunday than what we do on the other days of the week. We come here because God has called us to come here. Uh, God's call to us comes to us from Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. Many of you are going to be familiar with this passage because we just read it together this past week as a part of our Bible reading plan, Unfading Truth. Uh, we're going to begin here with verses 19 through 22. Brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, that's what gives us confidence to come in here, by this new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, here is what we are to do. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings. It's exactly what you've been called to do, to draw near to God this morning, to experience this full assurance that faith brings. As we do that, let's begin our time shutting off the distractions of the world so that we can focus on building our faith and that assurance that comes from God our Father. Let's do that in silent prayer. Well, as we come together to praise God this morning, our first song has somewhat of a funny name. To your temple I repair. Now that doesn't mean that we're coming in here today to fix things here in this building. Rather what it means is we're coming in here to be fixed. As we sing this song together, it's going to be a preview of what we're going to do this morning as we worship God. You'll see the song go through our different elements of worship. And it's also a prayer that as we do these things, God will bless us. Now don't get worried when you see verses one through seven. Uh, these verses are very short. We're going to go through them quickly. Uh, and so let's stand with the music. Let's sing praises to God for sure. But understand that you're praying for his blessing upon our worship here this morning.
God called you into this place. And now that you're here, he welcomed you. And again, we continue on with Hebrews chapter 10. We heard earlier that our command as God's people is to draw near to God. The passage goes on. Let us hold unswervingly, it says. Hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Why is it that you can hold on so tight to this hope that you've come to hear about this morning? Well, it's because he who promised this hope is faithful. And the one who promised this hope to you welcomes you with these words. He says to you, grace, mercy, and peace be yours. From God, our Father, from Jesus Christ, his Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I'll turn and greet those that God has brought into this place with you. We've just been reminded that we can hold on unswervingly to this faith that we profess because our God is faithful. And that's what we're going to sing of now as we sing his praises, this very familiar song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. We'll sing the three verses standing to sing.
As we came in here and we sang that opening prayer together, to thy temple I repair. Uh, remember, we prayed for a blessing from God as we hear his law proclaimed to us. And that's what we're going to do now. We're going to hear God's law. We're going to hear it in the summary form that Jesus gave to us, where he said, here's what God's law is. This is not complicated. I can sum it up in two sentences. First of all, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. That's the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law, all of the prophets, everything hang upon these two commandments. So as we hear these two commandments proclaimed to us here this morning, we're to use these commandments as a mirror of sorts, to to look at our reflection in the light of these two commandments and see how it is that we've so often failed to keep them. They're not complicated, we can understand them, but as we begin to think about how we've behaved in this past week, the things that we've done, the things that we've thought, So many of them, as we begin to look at them in this light, we see the sin that is so prevalent within each of us. And so that's why it's important for us to come here and confront God's law so that we can come to him in confession. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to bow our heads and we're going to pray a Puritan prayer of confession based on these two commandments that we've just heard. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with contrite hearts. We acknowledge our shortcomings in living out your greatest commandments. You have called us to love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. Yet we confess that our affections have often been divided Our devotion is often lukewarm, and our thoughts are so often distracted by the fleeting cares of this world. So forgive us, Lord, for the many times that we have not loved our neighbor as we love ourselves. We've harbored resentment. We've acted selfishly. We've spoken harsh words. We failed to see others as you see them and to serve them with the selfless love that you have shown us. So, O God of mercy, cleanse us from all of our sin. Renew a right spirit within us. Draw us closer to you. Help us to live a life that reflects your love and grace. Strengthen us by your spirit to love you wholly and to love others as you have first loved us. Father, may our life be a testimony to your boundless love that we might fulfill the commandments that you have given and that we might do so out of gratitude for the salvation that you have freely given to us. And so it's in the name of Jesus Christ who perfectly fulfilled your law of love on our behalf that we pray this prayer of confession. Amen. Well, having confessed our sins to God, we we move on to this part that we love where we're assured of the pardon that we have in Jesus Christ. And our selection this morning from Romans chapter 8 is one of the greatest assurances of pardon in the entire Bible. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why not? It's because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did He did what you were supposed to do. And he did that by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. (coughs) And so God condemned sin in the flesh through our Savior Jesus Christ in order that the righteous requirement of the law, that's the requirement that you and I were obligated to keep 
covenantally obligated to God to keep. It's been kept. It's been fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh. We live according to the spirit. So we've come to confess our sins to God. We've now been assured of the pardon that has been won for us by Jesus Christ. And so we move on then to how it is that we're going to leave this place. How it is that we're going to live in this coming week. We're going to live gratefully and to be instructed and that we're going to turn right back to the passage that we've begun with this morning, Hebrews chapter 10. Now we're going to read verses 24 and 25. Remember, we've been commanded to draw near to God. That's what brought us together here this morning. We've been told to hold unswervingly to this hope that we've just professed, that we just saw there in Romans chapter eight. Third, were to consider how it is that we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Notice how so often throughout God's word, it's addressed to us corporately, not just as individuals. Certainly God knows us as individuals. He chose us as individuals to be his own, but he's made us part of the church. And we're here to spur one another on, to encourage one another so that you and you and you do good deeds. I encourage you to do those good deeds and then you encourage me in my life and so on and so forth. We're not to give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. This is our opportunity to be together as God's people, to be instructed by his word and then to use that word to encourage one another. We need to do this every week, don't we? We need this encouragement. We're not able to do this on our own. We're encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day, that day that Christ will return. We're going to see this morning as we turn to the book of Acts that that ought to be our focus in all things. And it is here too as we begin a new week together, we keep that day in mind that it is approaching. So with all those things in mind, we have the privilege now of coming before our Father in heaven at the time of congregational prayer. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, again, we're grateful that you have called us into your house this morning. Oh, Father, you could have just left us on our own. You could have just left us in our sin, doing what we wanted to do in the first place, making ourselves miserable in the process. But you didn't do that. You and your grace and mercy called each one of us to belong to you. And we thank you for that. And you still didn't leave us as individuals, even though we were called to be your own. Father, you brought us together with your people. You made us into the most precious thing that you have, and that is your church. Father, we thank you for that. We pray that being members of your church would be our highest calling in life. You've given us so many callings, so many things to do, so many things that we're part of, things that are important for our livelihoods, things that are important for our schools and for our community here, Father. And we thank you for those callings, but the highest calling in our life, Father, is members of your church. And we pray that we would live out that calling in all of these different arenas that you have placed us in. Father, we pray for the people of this church, especially those who have been struggling with their health as of late. We thank you for the good news that Randy could have and the fact that he could get his radiation done this past week, uh, that they're not going to need to come in for quite some time to do more. They're confident in what they were able to do already, Father. And so we give you praise and thanksgiving for that. We pray that that radiation that was applied in this past week was effective, that it was able to hit the target and eliminate the new spot that he had growing in his brain. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, that you have brought him through that process so many times now. Uh, and so, Father, we pray that uh, what he has uh, undergone in this past week will be effective and that you will bring healing to him through that. 
Father, we thank you for the continued progression that Jay Lee makes uh, week after week. Every week is another small step forward. She was able to go outside this past week for the first time in her life. For most of us, that doesn't sound very impressive, but Father, when we remember everything that she's been through in her young life, uh, the fact that she's gotten to this point is nothing less than a miracle, and we thank you for it. Father, we pray that you would continue to sustain her, continue to help her grow, continue to help meet those benchmarks that need to be met for her to come home uh, and so that she, in the proper time, can come here with your people. We're so eager to meet our newest member, Father, and, and we thank you for your grace in her life. Father, we pray for the ministry of this particular congregation as things begin to ramp up once again. The, the summertime is over now and all of the activities that you have called us to here are beginning uh, in earnest once again. We pray for the Bible studies that are being formed. Father, we thank you for them and we pray for your blessing upon them. We pray for Sunday school as it begins in this coming week. We thank you for the teachers that you have called forward for that, for the children that will come to it, and for the material that you've given them to learn once again in this coming year. Father, we pray for your blessing on youth group and high school catechism as it begins once again on Wednesday night. We look forward to having all of our kids back here together again on Wednesday nights. It's always such a good time as we uh, learn what it is that you have called us to in life. We thank you for the fun activity that they could do this past weekend. Uh, and we thank you for all of these boys and girls that you have brought to us on a regular basis, Father. They're all children of your kingdom. They're all future leaders of your church. And so we thank you for the chance to mold and shape them. Father, we thank you for the work that's being done in conjunction with Minnesota West here in town with Campus Crusade coming in and wanting to have a presence, uh, a presence through our local churches here in Worthington. And so as once again, we meet tomorrow morning to plan that out. Father, we pray for your blessing upon that. Uh, Father, we thank you for all of the young men and women that you have brought to Worthington from so many different places to be part of Minnesota West. And we pray that during their time here that we as churches could be a blessing to them and help keep them fastened to that which they know is true from your word and for some of them to hear what is true for the first time in their life, Father. And so we pray for the privileges and the opportunities that you have already set aside uh, to bless Campus Crusade with here in our community. And Father, we also pray for our Bible reading plan, Unfading Truth. We thank you for all of the different communities across several countries now that it goes out to. Uh, what a blessing that is, Father, that so many of us are able to gather together, even though we're spread apart over so many uh, miles, but we're able to gather together and focus upon your word and focus upon your truth on a daily basis. Uh, and so we thank you for that. And we pray that it would continue to be a blessing as well. Father, we thank you that we can celebrate another birthday in this coming week, another significant birthday, and that of John Cheapstra as he celebrates his 96th birthday. We thank you for him, for the blessings in his life that he's been able to enjoy and that long life that you've given to him. Uh, Father, most of all, we thank you that he's been such a pillar of this church, and may that be an example to the rest of us as well. Father, be with us. All of us are busy in this coming week. All of us have a long list of things to do. Uh, and that's just the list that we have coming into the week. Certainly, there's going to be lots of things that we need to respond to, things that don't go according to our plans. Uh, Father, help us to remember what we learned here, that we are to hold unswervingly to the faith that we profess. Keep us close to that, even in the busyness of the work that lies ahead of us. All of this we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Our deacons are going to come forward now. This morning's offering is for the Helping Hand Pregnancy Center right here in Worthington. And our gifts for the Pregnancy Center, and uh, not just here in Worthington, but all across the state of Minnesota, our gifts have become all the more important since the state of Minnesota has withdrawn all funding from any sort of pregnancy center that will not recommend abortion. And so Helping Hands needs our help to help our community. Our deacons will come forward.
Well, we've come to the time in our service where we sing what we call our song of preparation. Our song of preparation to hear God's word proclaimed. And so this song of preparation, as it is this morning, is often, uh, is often framed in the context of a prayer. Uh, that's how we opened our service this morning. That's how we prepare ourselves to hear God's word now. Jesus, with your church abide. Again, these are short verses as well, and we'll sing all five of them. Stand with the music. You may be seated and open your Bible to the book of Acts. You'll find it on page 1,690. Now, I read something on the internet this past week, but I also know that, believe it or not, not everything that you read on the internet is true, is it? We have to use discernment as we scroll through those pages. Uh, and so I wanted to share what I read with you. And maybe as we read through this together, we can determine whether or not there's truth to the statement here that I read. It begins this way. As, a, as our society becomes more digitally connected, it paradoxical, paradoxically increases the feelings of isolation. In other words, what it's saying here is you can literally reach into your pocket and contact anyone else on this planet with ease, right? You can send a message not only across the community but across the globe and it's instantly received by the person that you sent it to. Not only that, but you have the entire corpus of literature and information that's been gleaned over the past several thousand years of human history, all accessible within a couple of moments. All of this stuff has come to us digitally now. We are more connected than ever. But yet, at the same time, we're we're more isolated than ever, right? And, and, and I think there, there's some truth to what this is saying here, that, that our communities, even those people that we see on a regular basis, even though they're so connected, yet at the same time, the paradox is they're isolated. It goes on here. It says, despite being surrounded by online networks, many people, especially the younger generation, Again, there's a paradox there, isn't there? Especially the younger generations feel lonely. They yearn for a deeper and more meaningful participation in a community or a cause. What do you think? Is this paragraph here that I read on the internet this past week, does it hold water? I think it does. 
I think it's an accurate description of our society as it is now. All of us so connected, all of us so able to put ourselves out there and express ourselves in one way or another, but at the same time, all of us fearing more, feeling more isolated than what we've ever felt before. And because of that, we're yearning for something in our society. We're yearning for something bigger than ourselves to be part of. You see, you have an intrinsic need. Intrinsic into the fact that you're made in God's image. And as part of that, you need to be in community. You do need to be part of something bigger than yourself. You do need to have this ongoing fellowship. Uh, this word that we call koinonia in the Bible is need to be surrounded by other people. And you do have a need to be continually connected to and reminded of what's true in a world that's so full of falsehoods. And that's exactly what the church is. That's exactly what the book of Acts is about. The church, what is the church? We've been talking a lot about this in the Bible reading plan and in our Sunday evening services, haven't we? And what we've learned so far is that the church is a holy congregation and gathering. Right? That's one of the things that we've learned on Sunday nights is the church is an institution, but before that, it's a gathering of people. That's literally what the Greek word for church means. Ecclesia, a gathering, an assembly of people. These are true Christian believers who are awaiting their entire salvation in Christ, who are washed by his blood, and who are sanctified and sealed by the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to be part of the church. And the reason that I put this slide in here right now for you to consider this morning is I want you to understand before we jump in to this book of Acts that we're going to spend so much time in over the next couple of weeks. Before we even jump in there, I want you to realize that you're different. That you're different than all of those people out there right now who are feeling so isolated and so lonely and so cut off from everybody who's around them. You are different than that because you're part of the church. And what a blessing that is. So as we go through the book of Acts here over these next couple of weeks, we're going to be focusing on how that church is formulated and put together. There's so many things that we could focus on in the book of Acts, uh, but that's what we're going to be looking at the most. What it means to be part of Christ's church. And so where else would we begin but the beginning? Right? Acts chapter 1. By the time we're done today, we're going to have read the entire chapter, but we're going to read it in three segments. Uh, and so we'll begin here, uh, I believe, with verses 1 through 8. Yes, we're looking at our mission here as members of the church. Verses 1 through 8. Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift which my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? 
He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We're going to pause there. You're going to want to leave your Bible out because we'll be picking it up at verse 9 in a few moments. But before we dive into this, let's pray for God's blessing upon his reading. Father in heaven, oh, we thank you in advance for making us members of your church. Father, we don't even fully understand what that means. We'll understand it more and more each week as we dig into it, as we dig into the foundations of your church here in the book of Acts. And so we pray for a blessing on it. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that each and every word that we just read, we can trust as being completely and totally true. And Father, there's really nothing else in this world that we can give that much trust to. And so as we dwell on these words and the words that will follow them throughout the course of our time together this morning, we pray that you would make those words come alive to us through the power of your Holy Spirit, which we have received. We thank you for that and pray for your blessing upon our time together. All of this we pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be looking at your mission this morning as members of the church. We're going to be, and you can see this in the, in the guide that was put together for you uh, in your bulletin. We're going to be looking at your mission. We're going to be looking at what our message is as part of that mission. And then we're going to be looking at the method that we've been given to carry this mission out. Let's begin with what the mission is. Your mission as a member of Christ's church is to be a witness. And in order for you to be a good witness, to do this, to carry out this mission well, you first need to know that the gospel is based on facts, not on feelings. And the reason that this needs to be emphasized now in our day and age is that because of the conventional wisdom of our society has completely turned this around. For so many people now, Christianity has just become a collection, a loose collect collection of witty and winsome and sometimes even wise sayings that were written thousands of years ago designed to make you feel better, to feel better about yourself, to feel better about the situation in life that you find yourself in. Karl Marx, you're familiar with that name, right? Karl Marx is somebody that we often associate with communism, but Karl Marx was not the father of communism. Karl Marx was a philosopher, a German philosopher, and I forget his particular dates, but it's right around 100 years ago that he did his work. And of course, he comes to so many conclusions uh, that as Western capitalists just, just gall at us, right? They're, they're just so wrong, so far outside of what we know to be true. But yet there are some things that he said, uh, predictions that he made about Western society, which are beginning to come true now. And one of those famous predictions that Karl Marx, of all people, made was that religion, remember what he said about religion, it would become the opiate of the people. Right? And you know what he meant by that when he said it would become the opiate of the people. It would be that thing, that drug that they take in a sense, that's designed to make everything else feel better. And he was absolutely right about what, would, about what religion in our society would become. Because in so many quarters, even quote-unquote evangelical churches... <laughs> have been focused on Christianity as a means and as a therapy to make people feel better about themselves. And that's not what it is. 
The problem with that, of course, is that it leads to this attitude and this idea, which again has become prevalent in our society, that if there are teachings or beliefs in this book that make you feel better, well, then you should hold on to them. And if there are teachings and beliefs communicated in this book uh, that just kind of make you feel uneasy with things and, and that you don't like so much, well, you set those ones aside. You, you hang on to that which makes you feel good. You let go of that which you just don't happen to agree with at the moment. That's not how Luke understood what the gospel is about. Now, why are we talking about Luke? Well, it's because Luke is the one who wrote this book that we're going to be going through. How do we know that? Well, we know that because of its opening sentence here. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. In other words, this book is a sequel. It's a continuation. And we can be certain, even though we don't read Luke's name at the beginning of it, that it's connected to the gospel that he wrote because of that name that we do see, Theophilus. And we say, oh, I know I've read that name before. And so we go back and we look at the gospel that Luke wrote. And we look at the opening words of it. And Luke writes, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who were, who were the first, who, who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, Luke writes, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. Right? The same person that the, that the book of Acts was written to is the same as the person who's mentioned here at the beginning of Luke's gospel. Uh, Luke tells Theophilus exactly what he was going to do. Luke is not a Jew, by the way. Maybe some of you know this already, that Luke has a Greek background, and he's very well educated. He's a physician, in fact. And so he takes the scientific mind that he has and the gifts that he has, and you can see the methodology that he applies to this here. He wanted to investigate every aspect of these rumors that he had heard going around about Christianity. And so he set himself to it. He investigated everything from the beginning and he wrote up an orderly account of Jesus' life and ministry. And now he's going to be doing the same thing in the book of Acts. Why did he do that? Well, it's because of what we read in verse four of his gospel. Theophilus, I did this for you so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. Now ordinarily, that little verse right there wouldn't capture our attention the way that it does this morning, but we don't live in ordinary times, do we? Right now, there is an assault on certainty, not just in our society, we would expect that, but there's an assault on certainty even from within our own churches. Many of you know that for the past several years, on a denominational level, the CRC has been struggling with this concept of human sexuality. Uh, and, and certainly there are a lot of aspects to that that are difficult for us to move forward in. And we want to understand that well. And, and so we have to talk through a lot of difficult concepts. But really the underlying the underlying foundation of that discussion really had nothing to do with human sexuality. That was just the symptom that we were addressing. The underlying issue uh, that, that, that formed the foundation for these last three years of, of really difficult discussions has to do with can we or can we not be certain of what the Bible says for us to believe? And there are some, even within our own denomination, who say, no, 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 we can't. We can't be certain of anything. We can only trust. And Luke here is telling us just the opposite. 
that yes, you can be certain. I carefully investigated each one of these things so that you could know for sure that these words are true, so that you could trust them, so that you could cling to them as we were told earlier. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to have doubts along the way. That doesn't mean that you're not going to have questions about what the Bible says that you struggle with and sometimes even lose sleep over for a time. That's part of the process. That's part of coming to understand these things. And again, that's part of why you're surrounded by other people in here. So that when those struggles come along, you can reach out to somebody who's been through that same struggle that you're in now and can come through it and can come to hold on to the certainty that these words are designed to have. And so as we go back to Acts, Luke says, well, here are the facts. Here's what's happened. Jesus suffered. Jesus presented himself and he gave many convincing proofs he was alive. Now, Luke lists out some of those convincing proofs towards the end of his own gospel. You can read those at home this afternoon. And Jesus appeared to them over a period of 40 days. And Luke says, I'm going to pick up the story from there. We'll begin after those 40 days, Luke says. That's how the book works. So the gospel is based on these facts. really has nothing to do with how you feel about them. And understand, we turn that around so easily, we want to talk about how the Bible makes us feel. There's a time and place for that because the Bible does solidify our feelings, doesn't it? It does give us solid ground to stand on, a, a confidence uh, that then permeates its way into every other aspect of life. But before we can enjoy that confidence and share that confidence with others, we got to deal with these facts. We have to know them well. That's what Jesus did so well. He consistently stays on mission as he went through his ministry and as he goes through these last few moments with his disciples. He's patiently fending off distractions all the time. If you remember the Gospels, you remember that there's this crowd at the beginning of his ministry that's always constantly following him around, constantly wanting Jesus to perform more miracles, constantly wanting Jesus to heal their diseases. And Jesus does indulge that, but he's always trying to get away from that, isn't he? He says, that's not my mission. That's not why I came here. You need to hear what I have to say. You don't just need to see what I can do. You need to hear what I say. And so he's always trying to get rid of that crowd who just wants miracles. He's always trying to slow down the process and talk about the deeper things. And we see the same thing going on here. Verses 4 and 5 of what we just read. He tells his disciples, don't leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift that my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. It's the Holy Spirit. You remember, guys, he says to his disciples, do you remember what I told you? And you can read about what Jesus told his disciples on that last night before he went to the cross. There's like four or five chapters in the Gospel of John that's dedicated to it. And so much of those four or five chapters where Jesus is speaking with his disciples are centered around this gift of the Holy Spirit that Jesus would give now he's saying, the time's come, guys. Now put yourself in, in the position of these disciples. You're talking to and sitting down and eating with a guy that you saw murdered. A guy that you saw put into a hole in the ground. And now you're sitting with him and you're eating food with him and you're listening to him and he's reminding you of the gift that he's going to give to you. What would you be curious about right now? Would you be curious? I, I want to hear more about this gift. Tell me more about that, Jesus. That's not what these disciples ask. They miss the point once again. 
And we're going to see a shift in these disciples so often in the Gospels, right, that all they do is miss the point. <laughs> and now as we read through the book of Acts, this is really going to be the last time they really get things wrong. But they ask this question to Jesus. Imagine you get a chance to ask Jesus a question and you bomb it this much. Uh, here's what happens. The disciples say, yeah, 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 Jesus, you've told us about that gift. We want to know if you're going to solve our political problems. We want to know if you're going to reestablish the kingdom for Israel and get rid of these pesky Romans. Do you see how short-sighted they are? Do you see how short-sighted people in general are apart from the power of the Holy Spirit? They haven't received this power from the Holy Spirit yet. They haven't received that filter, so to speak, that helps them see the lie from the truth. They're still operating in that old paradigm. And you see what it is that you and I are stuck in when we're in that old paradigm. It's only the things that concern us right now. That's what they're worried about. Are you going to respond to the, or are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus does what he's done so many times. He consistently stays on mission. He doesn't even really entertain the question. He says, I came here to tell you about the kingdom of God. That's what he spent those 40 days doing. And that shouldn't really surprise us, right? Because how many times now hasn't Matthew chapter 4 verse 17 appeared on our screens? Because this is the first words that Jesus spoke as part of his public ministry. He said, repent. And by now most of you know what that word means. It means change the way that you think. You need to change the way that you think. Because the kingdom of heaven, as Matthew puts it, or the kingdom of God, as Luke puts it, really the same thing. The kingdom of heaven has come near. This has been the consistent focus of Jesus throughout his three-year ministry. And it continues to be his focus after he raises from the dead. He gives his disciples two more promises. You will receive power. What a promise. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Now this is critical for you to understand right here because you come into play here in verse 8. These men that Jesus was speaking to, his disciples who are becoming apostles with a capital A, a very temporary church office. We'll talk about that over these next couple of weeks. These apostles certainly are able to be the witnesses for Christ in Jerusalem, aren't they? And they're able to go out from Jerusalem into Judea and Samaria, two very different places, places that were opposed to one another, but they brought the gospel to those places. They were within the vicinity of Jerusalem. And some of these apostles are even going to go out into the known world at that time, into the entire Roman Empire. And they're going to make it as far as Italy on the west, and they're going to make it into Central Asia on the east. But that's as far as they're going to go. And so Jesus' promise here isn't fulfilled in this first generation of witnesses. That promise is continuing to be fulfilled even now. And so as a member of Christ's church, this, this assignment that our Savior has given to you is very, very relevant. It continues on. This is our purpose as members of Christ's church. It's to be a witness to what Jesus did and stay on mission the way that Jesus did. Because this is really what witnessing is all about. It's taking these two things and putting them together. It's consistently, like what Jesus was, consistently staying on mission, and it's consistently reporting facts that we know to be true. That's what witnessing is, just reporting these facts that we know to be true. Oh, we turn it into something else all of the time, don't we? What witnessing is not is being a means to another end. And that's so often what the church does. 
The church wants to make witnessing into a means, into a, a social end to transform our communities or to a political end to transfer or to, 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 to enhance our government. And we see that happen right now, right? Right now, if you spend any time at all reading about the evangelical church, you'll read a lot about what's called Christian nationalism, right? And it's really a boogeyman that's been built up. Certainly, there are churches that push politics far too much, especially on the right of center. Uh, and that's not what the church is supposed to do. But it's really not nearly as big as what you're being told that it is. And often... The people who are criticizing Christian nationalism the most, if you really look into them, what they're saying is, no, 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 we shouldn't be trying to make America great again. What we need to be focusing is on social justice and, and uh, looking at all of the evil systems within our society. It's a very Marxist out, outcome. And, and what Jesus is reminding us here today is, don't get stuck on either one of those two ends. That's not what the purpose of witnessing is about. The purpose of witnessing is also not just about lifestyle enhancements. In other words, if you come to church and if you read this book, your life will be so much better than what it would be if you don't. Now, there's truth in that, isn't there? But again, that's not the purpose of witnessing. Witnessing is also not just a personal testimony about what God has done in your life or how it is that you feel so much better now that you've come to Christ. Again, those things might be true. And we're going to see personal testimony used as a tool throughout the book of Acts. We're not saying to throw that away altogether. We're saying it's not the point. Nobody wants to hear about how much better your life is. What people want to hear is the truth of the gospel. The facts as they've been given to us. That's what we need to stick to. We need to stick to the fact that our world was created by a triune God. And that you and I were created in his image. But you and I, through our representative Adam, made the wrong choice and we cast ourselves into sin. And so now that image of God within each of us has been marred and things are not the way that it's supposed to be. But Jesus Christ came and he was, as our old hymn says, that double cure for us. He atoned and paid for your sin and he also met that righteous requirement of the law that you and I were supposed to meet. And guess what? He's coming back again. That's the gospel, isn't it? And that's why we read about this word witnessing 39 times throughout the book of Acts. So we can be quite certain here this morning that this is what you and I have been called to, to be witnesses. So as we look at this first section, that your mission as a member of the church, this thing that sets you apart from the world, that gives you this community that you intrinsically need, your mission is first of all to be a witness, to, to know the facts of the gospel, not just how you feel about it. To stay on that mission the way that Jesus did, so that as a witness you can consistently report the truth of the gospel. So the question that we have for you to consider, how is it that you, having been given this task now, how is it that you can improve your witnessing skills? And I emphasize that word skills because this is exactly what it is. And I think that as this group of people here, we can wrap our heads around that word quite well because of our association with being good athletes here in this community, right? You know what it takes to build up a skill, whether that's shooting free throws, whether that's hitting the ball, or whatever the case may be, it's repetition, 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 practice, practice, Practice. This is how we build up our skills. Right? So think about that in this coming week. What things can you do? How can you practice this skill of being a witness? 
So we've looked at what our mission is to be a witness. Now let's look at what our message is. And to do that, we're going to go right back to where we left off, verse 9. We look at the certain hope that we've been given. We're on page 1,691, about halfway down the page, starting at verse 9. After Jesus said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. So we'll set that chapter aside. Now we'll come back to verse 12 in a moment. Now, this passage here covers the ascension of Jesus Christ, which in my humble opinion is probably the most theologically significant act or event of Jesus' ministry. We get together in this building to celebrate his birth every Christmas, don't we? We get together in this building, and in fact, we go in and we meet with our neighbors at American Reformed on Resurrection Day to celebrate his, his victory over death. And, and his birth and his victory over death are hugely important, aren't they? But somehow we always forget what is the most important, that our Savior who was risen from the grave is now seated at the right hand of God the Father and is interceding on our behalf. That's the ascension. And that's why every year we get together in this place with a much smaller group and we celebrate the ascension. We're not going to focus on that here this morning because, again, the time will come where we can do that again this year. We're going to look at some of the other aspects as to what Jesus says to his disciples in this uh, passage here. And what we want to start with here is just how easy it is for us, again, being represented by these disciples at this point, how easy it is for us to get stomped. And that's exactly what these guys are. Verse 11. Verse 10 and 11, really. Now, even if, even if Luke didn't put that signature, in a, in a sense, in the, in the opening verses of this where he writes to Theophilus, we would know that Luke wrote the book of Acts. We would know for two reasons. Number one, Luke likes to include a lot of facts. He's an investigator, right? Secondly, I look forward to meeting Luke someday because he has this really dry sense of humor. You don't really know if he's telling a joke or not, but it's actually really funny. That's what we see going on here. Just think of this scene here, these, these disciples just staring at the sky, uh, wondering what's going on. Uh, and, and these two guys show up to them, and, 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 uh, and, and you can almost imagine that they don't even see these two guys. And, and notice Luke says it's two men dressed in white. We often want to jump ahead of Luke say, and, and say, well, those must have been angels. Luke doesn't tell us that. And remember, Luke loves facts. And so if that fact that these men were angels was important, he certainly would have told us. As it is, he didn't tell us, and so it's a safe conclusion to say, well, it's not very important for us to speculate on that. And it's just these two men dressed in white. And they come up to these disciples staring into the sky, and the disciples probably don't even hear their approach. Right? But so often, this is where we're at. We don't know what to do next. And we face this as individuals within the church. We don't know which route to go when we're at a crossroads. And we face this as a congregation at times, too. A big decision needs to be made. We don't know what to do. And so often we just individually or corporately stare up at the sky, clueless. And so God sends us messengers, as he did to his disciples that day. And they ask this question here, which you can almost see the smirk on Luke's face as he writes it. These guys just come up and say, hey, boys, <laughs> what are you looking at there? Why are you looking into the sky? You've got work to do. Didn't you just hear what Jesus said to you? You need to go out and be his witnesses. You're going to receive power. And there you are looking into the sky. What they do is they recenter these men on the facts once again, reminding them what's going to happen that this same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back. You've got a message of hope to share with people. 
these two men say. <coughs> so easy for us to get stumped, though, and to miss what it is that is our hope. And this is our secure hope, isn't it? That Jesus will return. Now, we have a ton of things to communicate as the church. We have stacks of books of theology. Theology, remember, is nothing more than the application of Scripture, which never changes, to life, which constantly changes. And we need to learn that theology. We have cadet lessons to go through in the next couple of months, and gems lessons, and so on and so forth. We have practices uh, that we can share with other people in this world that will help them uh, enjoy God's blessing in their life. If we just live this way, we tell people, God will bless it. And he's not blessing you because of the way that you're living. We want to share that with people. We have lots of insights for how we think our society ought to be run. And they're good insights. They're biblical insights that we want to share with people. But what we're being reminded right now by these two men dressed in white, is that our primary hope has nothing to do with our theology, as important as what that is. It has nothing to do with helping people experience blessings here in life, as important as what that is. And it has nothing to do with our insights for society, as important as what that is. Our primary hope, the foundation for the rest of it, is that Jesus will come back. That's what we're being reminded of here. Jesus is returning. This is what Jesus says, the last few words of the Bible. He says, look, I'm coming back soon. You say, well, what does that mean? And I don't know. God keeps time differently than what I do. But Jesus said he's coming back soon. And he said, my settlement is with me. And I'm going to give that settlement to each person according to what they deserve. Now, this is not good news. This is not good news if you're persisting in your rebellion against Jesus Christ. He says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to settle with you. You owe me something. That's not what I created you to do. You haven't fulfilled your obligation to me. That's bad, bad news. This is good news, however, for those of you who heeded the words that we heard last week from John 3, 16, that God so loved the world, that he sent his one-of-a-kind son, that whoever believes into him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Remember, believe into him. That sounds funny, doesn't it? And it reads funny, too, in the Greek that it was written in. What it means is that you trust in Christ implicitly for everything, especially for your salvation. For those of you who have that trust, who believe into Christ, this is something that we look forward to beyond anything else. Your mission is to be a witness. The message that you are to witness to is this certain hope that Jesus Christ is coming back again. Now, there are lots of ways for you to express your hope. Lots of ways for you to express your hope. You can share with people. This has been my experience as a Christian, and it's been really good. You can share your lived experience. You can share your ideas for a better society with people. They do need to hear them. You can say, well, as we look at things politically over these next few weeks, here's what the Bible says. All of those things are important. All of those things are ways to express your hope. But all of those things must be framed with this question in mind. How does the hope of Christ's return Form a foundation for all of your other hope. In other words, as you look at your lived experience, how is the fact that Christ is coming back, how does it form the foundation for your experience? As you begin to recommend ways for our society to be, how does the fact that Christ is returning influence the way that you think about your society or your politics or whatever the case is? And as you think about those things over this coming week, 
If there's a disconnect, which there often is going to be, I've found it in myself, as I've thought about it these last few days. If there's a disconnect between what you're saying and thinking to yourself and the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back again, well, then you need to repair that disconnect. Everything must be focused on the fact that Jesus Christ is returning. That's what it all boils down to. So we've seen that your mission is to be a witness, that your message as that witness must be the facts of certain hope that Jesus Christ is returning again, and those facts then underlie all of the things that we can share with people. How do we do this? Your method Verses 12 through 26. And it's not what you expect. Meetings. Let's pick up a reading of verse 12. Jesus has just ascended into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, which was a Sabbath day walk not very far from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter and John. You recognize these names, right? Peter and John and James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas, the other Judas. This guy's the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and along with Jesus' brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, which was a group numbering of about 120. And he said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number, and, we shared, and he shared in this ministry. Now, with the reward that he got for his wickedness, and you can see that Luke has looked into this, Judas bought a field. He there fell headlong, and his body burst open, and all of his intestines spilled out. And everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, and so they called that field, in their language, uh, Ekeldama, which means the field of blood. Now, Peter continues. For, said Peter... It's written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted. Let there be no one to, there to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, Peter says, it's necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us for the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out amongst us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when he was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, who's also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go to where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. And so he was added to the 11 apostles. Your method is meetings. Now, granted, we want something much more exciting to happen here. The biggest event in history, even bigger than the resurrection, in my opinion, as important as what the resurrection is, is the fact that Jesus, in the form of a man, in the body of a man, representing you and I, Jesus successfully re-enters the kingdom of heaven and sits down at the right hand of God. That has just happened. And we want Jesus at this point to kind of start handing out the spiritual armor, so to speak, to these disciples. Here you guys go. Put this on. We've got a battle to fight. John is going to tell you when the time comes about this dragon that's waging war against us. And you guys are about to go and fight back. That's the kind of story that you and I want to hear, isn't it? That's not at all what happens. What we see here is this church that we're part of has order. It has order. The first thing that they do after this most important event is they get together and have a meeting. Peter stands up. There's about 120 there. That's a very important number because that's the number that was required to start a new synagogue somewhere. And guess what? They have it. A new synagogue is beginning, so to speak. 
They have a meeting. And, and this process continues throughout the book of Acts. The church is going to grow like crazy in Jerusalem. And guess what? The ethnicities aren't going to get along. Uh, and so they have to have a meeting in Acts chapter 6. And they appoint deacons to help out with the situation. The church is going to grow even more throughout the Roman Empire. And guess what? The ethnicities aren't going to get along. And so they have a big meeting in Acts chapter 15. Uh, and then time goes on and Paul and Barnabas can't get along with one another. And so Paul confers with the local Christians there. What should I do? And he leaves Barnabas and he goes on with Silas. This process here of having meetings continues on throughout the church's early history as it does now. In fact, that's one of the primary instructions that Paul was going to write to the churches. Number one, he says to Timothy, your most important job appoint elders. And then he says to the Corinthians, I want to see everything done in good order. Maybe that sounds frustrating to you. Right? Who really likes to go to meetings? And it seems that the business of the church is slow and plodding on and things don't get done as quickly as you think that they ought to be done. And I know that's frustrating. I've experienced that frustration too. But what we're seeing here is this isn't our organization. This is Christ's church. And he's called us to conduct it in a careful and an orderly way so that we can make sure that we're following Christ and not our own whims. And God blesses this pattern here that Peter begins. And so this is what we as a church try and emulate as well, doing things in good order. Well, what is that order? Well, that order is that the church is regulated. That's an important word in theology. It's regulated by scripture. We call this the regulative principle. Peter says in, back in verse 15, remember, he said, Scripture must be fulfilled. And then he looks at Psalm 109 there, where it says another must take his place of leadership. And so Peter looks at Scripture, looks at its application to the truth. And Peter here is working under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, even though he doesn't know it yet at this point in time. And Peter says, it's necessary then. If Scripture tells us to do it, we must do it. And so that's exactly what they did. It's necessary to choose one of the men. Uh-oh. One of the men. How come it's got to say that? Didn't we read something about all these women who were there also? And haven't we read in the Gospels that the ministry of Jesus Christ would have never been what it was without the constant support of the women who were with him? Absolutely. But yet Scripture also consistently, whether we understand this in our society or not, Scripture consistently calls men to these leadership positions. And you can see the church here, even though it has an abundance of fully qualified women, women who will go on to serve the church in a big way, as we'll read about them in the Gospel of Acts, which is really the way to think of it. It's men who are chosen to fill out these roles. Now this certainly isn't our go-to passage for understanding why it is that churches like ours continue to follow this principle of having male leadership and male headship, we call it, but it's just another example. And remember, the primary job of these men who are going to be chosen is to become witnesses. So our church here isn't to follow the whims of society and taking in whatever change society makes, whether those changes are good or not. Our job is to follow God's design for us in Scripture. And at this point in history, that's making us look very, very unpopular, very, very misogynistic, very, very whatever adjective that you want to put in there. But all we're doing is humbly following the pattern that's been set to be witnesses. That's our job, not to change society. Our job is to be witnesses. So they nominate two men. Then they pray over these two men. And then they take action. And they move forward. Now that's not a very exciting Bible story, is it? 
But this is how the church works. And we're going to see this church, having followed this good order, go on to do some amazing things under the power of the Holy Spirit. Your mission is to be a witness. Your message is certain hope. And the method that we follow, as boring as what it sometimes is, is meetings in good order. Now the question for you to think about is, how do you fit into the church's order? And guess what? Everybody here, men and women, boys and girls, people of all ages, fit into this order somewhere. There's a way for you to contribute. There's a way for you to be part of it. There's a way for you to submit to it. How is it that you fit? Be thinking about that this week. You're a member of Christ's church. This is what your primary identity ought to be. How do you fit? What are you going to do to support the good order of this church? That's something to think about for this coming week. Let's thank God for this foundation that Christ has built for us as members of his church. Father in heaven, we thank you for your church. We thank you for calling us to be members of it, for giving us exactly what we need as image bearers of you, this intrinsic need that we have to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Father, you have fulfilled that for us. You've made us members of your church. We thank you for that. Father, may we always remember what that means. And first and foremost, it's to be a witness, to understand the facts of the gospel, to be able to present those in a clear and cogent way appropriate to the situations that we find ourselves in. And then to build our own opinions and our own society and our own way of working things out according to your word, all in service of the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. Father, help us to keep that as our solid foundation. We thank you for that promise. We thank you that we have received the power that you have promised the, to these disciples. We'll talk about that as we turn to the second chapter next week. Bless us in this week of work that we have ahead of us. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we respond to God's word, we're going to sing a song that we often associate with thanksgiving. And, and for sure, the very first verse of it is going to be all about thanksgiving. But really watch verses 2 and 3 and, and see how this song is thanking God for the church and asking for guidance for her. So stand with the music and let's sing these three verses together. We're coming back here at 6 o'clock tonight, and we're going to be looking. If you Maybe the, that last little portion of Acts was a bit on the boring side for you about meetings and stuff like that. We're going way to the opposite end of the spectrum. And we're going to look at Numbers chapter 16, where the earth opens up and swallows those who stand in rebellion to the church. And if you come here tonight... 
And if you can somehow convince me that staying home and watching TV would have been more exciting than what we're going to read about tonight, I'll take you out for a steak dinner. That's my guarantee. This passage is awesome. You're not going to want to miss it. That's 6 o'clock here this evening. We leave now with a benediction, words of grace that come to us directly from our God. He says to you, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Why? Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen.